So we continue to deal with an exceptionally unusual economic set of disruptions. As policymakers, we're committed to using our tools to help see the economy through what has been a uniquely challenging period. The insights you share in these events help us to home in on the challenges and opportunities that are shaping what we might think of as the new normal of the American economy. So in a normal economy, if demand softens a lot, you know, first thing businesses do, you know, they often will lay off workers. This is, seems like an unusual economy where businesses have been scrambling to get workers for so long. If demand softens, do you think they would respond differently this time in terms of uh, those workforces, or do you think they just would, would do the kind of usual playbook in terms of trying to shrink costs? Right, yeah. Um, it, pro it probably depends on the business a bit. Um, obviously, everyone's different, and I don't know all of them, but I do think they would approach it differently. Um, I think one of the things that, at least in our space, they may consider doing is looking more closely at who is it that may actually be close to retirement age anyway, that we could help them, and now they maybe feel comfort to be able to leave the workforce. And then how do we get that tribal knowledge out of that individual before they leave, right? Um, the big thing with our workforce is going to be that the, the people who may necessarily want to leave the workforce at some point in time, they have all of the knowledge on how to do everything, every average good that we see in this country, right? There's some guy sitting in an office that's a tool maker that knows exactly how to manufacture that part. Um, I don't think they would do massive rounds of layoffs, but I do think they would potentially strategically say, hey, let's, I mean, frankly, let's rank our A, B, and C players, right? Who adds the most value in our business and who are we hiring because we were just really desperate for people in this massive demand surge, and they may choose to let go of some of those individuals. But that would always, for them, be non-skilled labor. I can't see any circumstance where they would get rid of skilled labor um, and would probably not be a critical mass of their workforce for the most part, at least in the privately held businesses I work with. I, I can't speak as much for the publicly traded guys. Welcome to Key Stock and Crypto Channel. And we had Jerome Powell in the house again. And you heard that correct. The new normal. And they're speaking about the life after the C word. And guys, they talk about manufacturing coming back to the United States. Kids don't want to do that. But they know the days of China's manufacturing is over for the U.S. The United States has to manufacture its own products. But guys, you don't want to do this type of manufacturing. And you know I told you a long time ago this day was coming. Now what they're going to do is start re-educating the kids. You don't need a college education. How soon things have changed. And we know automation is going to change everything that we do. And we know it's going to cause a lot of layoffs. We know this 15% tax to the corporations is going to push them over to automation. We know the Fed is raising rates and shrinking liquidity and that's less capital to these small businesses. We've had the longest expansion in history. But guys, we know the reason why. And let's listen in. Two questions about the, the long run. I, in my previous life, life, I was a professor at Michigan State. So had students from Michigan. And in my senior seminar on the current state of the economy, and I taught it for about uh, 15 years or so, the last time I taught it was 2019, and the question that I posed at the beginning of the semester is, do you think you're better off than your parents were at this age? And for the first time in 2019, students said, post-Great Recession, they said that they thought that they were better off because they had interesting jobs that their parents had to work on the line, and that they thought these were boring jobs. So, you know, people don't want to show up for uh, tool and die jobs. My students' reaction would be, that's boring, that's not the Apple store. So, like, that seems long-term. That seems structural. So, so how, do you, how do you address that? I mean, this, yeah, how do, you, how, how, do you, how do your businesses say that they would address something like that? Yeah. How do you make, make manufacturing sexy? Yeah, if that's that's the end all question that we face almost every day with our businesses. It's very challenging to make manufacturing sexy. I'll tell you that. I would tell you that if you go into the average manufacturing facility, there are floors that I would eat off of. I mean, there are impeccable mm -hmm. facilities in this country. They're beautifully maintained. Everything from, I mean, yes, OEMs and tier ones, very large companies are doing a great job. But I walk into $10 million plants that are 
beautiful, have state-of-the-art equipment. You've got 20-somethings working on million-dollar machines and coding that never got a four-year degree but went to an apprenticeship program and are doing really cool stuff. The biggest challenge we have is encouraging more people to do that. The only way that we found success so far, at least our clients have, is they've focused on actually talking to the parents at very young ages, so starting in like elementary and middle school, about the benefits and the career development opportunities in manufacturing that don't require a four-year degree. I have a four-year degree. I know many people here have a lot more than one four-year degree, so I understand the benefits of higher education, but it doesn't mean that everyone needs it. So we're focused very strong on trying to encourage people to go into manufacturing because it's I'm a nerd for it, but it's really cool. <laughs> so I have just a quick question, um, and this is a longer-term question, too. So to what extent, because of these labor demand challenges, to what extent have businesses adopted automation to fill the labor demand? Yeah, they. so they absolutely focus on automation um, pretty clearly all the time. I was at, um, you spoke about big conferences. I was at the Inter- International Ma- Manufacturing Technology Show in Chicago a couple weeks ago. Actually very well attended, so that was positive. I stayed at a Marriott. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> 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 But either way, we were at that show, um, and the core focus was on automation. So it's everything from automation within a machining cell. So if you're cutting a piece of steel, they're really focused on how do I have multiple pallets to make sure that I can do things um, without people, right? How can I run this machine for 24 hours and then have some guy sitting at home on his cell phone being able to monitor it? Because, I mean, they have that technology today. Every machine monitoring company will give you an app on your phone. Um, So they're focused quite a bit on that piece of it. There's also a lot of automation in terms of lifting and material handling, um, and even in terms of some of the warehousing pieces of it as well. So how do I get a machine to wrap a box, and how do I get, frankly, any automation to do what even in manufacturing we may call the less intriguing jobs, um, so that we can have people actually making parts and actually designing and actually checking quality and doing the things that are, what I'll say, more fun than packaging a box of parts, right? We have, at this point, automation that can yeah, it's not only modern uh, monetary theory. It, it was never a good idea. It, it was a, a stupid idea, and, and we're seeing living proof of that. You can't print forever and think you can get away with it. Look at what the pound's doing. But I think if there's a lesson to be learned here, it's the fact that central bankers in general and governments in particular have this unique relationship that we need to find a way to separate. And it isn't necessarily a political relationship. It's an enabling relationship. They are enablers. By these low interest rates and hanging out at zero for so long, they allowed governments to do anything. They allowed companies to remain that should have died. They ruined the entire infrastructure of global finance. And to think that it's going to come together easily or if central banks have any plan, there is no way to put this Humpty Dumpty back together. There needs to be lots of financial destruction first, and from that, the Arizona will rise. The best fertilizer for the global economy right now is for all of these issues, whether it's foreign exchange, government debt, corporates, all of these financial instruments have to be pushed down to some level that represents true risk to value returns versus the pie in the sky valuations and returns that many were getting with virtually no risk. And CNBC speaks about the Fed. But guys, we know the Fed printed all this money to build the fourth industrial revolution. So we know the reason why they did it. They're not going to tell us on television, but we know what the goal is. And we know the money printing, the 0% interest rates, allow them to buy up the globe. Now we have these banks as big as they've been. We have corporations as as big as they've been in history. These big banks and big corporations are monopolies. And the people are busy working, taking care of their family, barely making it. And they're not looking at reality because they're so distracted on things that don't matter. The dollar is as strong as it's ever been. And that is hurting the emerging markets. And eventually, they're not going to have any choice but to get off the dollar. We see that China Digital Yuan is making its way through the emerging markets to make it that second option. And of course, if you're in the emerging markets being destroyed by inflation and the Digital Yuan is going to be stable, then of course, you're going to go with it. 
and we're going to see a sell-off in treasuries, and we're going to see America, the Roman Empire fall, and the rise of China the Dragon with that digital yuan backed by that digital SDR. But guys, that's all I have for you. Have a great day. Basis points like this jumping in minutes. I don't think it's unexpected, Becky. We've talked about this before, but I just want to come back to Steve's comment about hugging the dots. Uh, I was a dot for almost 10 years, and Janet Yellen <laughs> never hugged me. I mean, so uh, and the you're dot feeling plot, neglected. I'm feeling neglected. I'm feeling hurt. Um, look, the most important part is what they're doing in the, for the next meeting, the short-term future. The long-term, it's pure guesswork. Uh, and uh, we know where they're going. And they have to slay the inflationary dragon. They let that, just to mix metaphors, they let that horse out of the barn. It's hard to get him back in. And uh, they got work to do. The business of landing, hard or soft, the greater evil is inflation if you're a central banker. So we've seen these movements. Money was free for so long, Becky, that I think we have a whole slew of investors and advisors that have forgotten. When money costs something, the two-year where you just quoted or the 10-year where it is, there's an opportunity cost in terms of investing in other assets, in equities. So I'm not surprised. Uh, I do think we're going to see a 4% 10-year pretty soon, certainly by year end. And we'll just have to see where this goes. The, the best thing, Becky, for us, and look at the pound this morning. It got to 110. Look at the DXY, as was referred to earlier, 112. Uh, I believe, this is my personal view, that the strong dollar is actually holding yields down. And uh, we ought to be grateful for it. We have to finance next year a trillion and a half new issuance of treasuries. A trillion comes out of deficits. Half a, a trillion comes out of the Fed spinning their stuff out of the treasuries out of the balance sheet. Thankfully, someone's buying it. It's foreign private investors. As China is selling off, Japanese just roll their treasury bills. We are very fortunate that we're the most we're, we're the most attractive country, as was mentioned earlier. And the analogy I use is we're secretariat at Belmont in 1973. We're 31 lengths ahead of every other country right now. And mm. that's sucking in capital, suppressing yields, in my view.